Welcome to the This Is Horror podcast. I'm your host, Michael David Wilson, and I'm joined as always by my co-host, Bob Pastorella. How's it going, Bob? Excellent, Michael. How are you doing this evening? Great, thank you. We've just got off the call with John Padgett, so we've got another two-part interview coming your way, and it's a great conversation. Definitely some great stuff here. Man, the guy is just a phenomenal writer uh and uh new new to the scene but so so important so important for what he's doing new to the scene but been writing for a long time i mean as we get into in the conversation one of the stories was 20 years in the making right but the secret of ventriloquism his collection one of the standout collections of last year I believe, in fact, it was voted by Rue Morgue as the best fiction collection of last year. And if you've read it, you'll know why. And if you haven't and you do read it, you're in for a treat. And you're also going to be very scared. I think it's fair to say. It's a frightening collection. Definitely. Very frightening. Very, uh... Oh man, it's it's uh, can't even find the right words. It's 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 filled with dread. There are moments that will make you kind of laugh out loud. Uh, there's some there's some definite humor there, but there's a there's a, a, a very confidence in the writing ability that's that you don't you just don't find it. You just don't find it in, in, in a lot of books that are published today. This, you know, even though, you know, he's been writing on like some of these stories for over 20 years and we got somebody who, you know, he basically only has like one, one collection out. Uh, there's a confidence there. You can tell the man, the man has been studying the craft for quite a while. Oh yeah. And when I say it's frightening and I got into this in the conversation, it's frightening because of that atmosphere, because of that dread, as you said, Bob, and it's just disquieting throughout. Even when nothing is happening, you feel like something could happen. And to create that fear, I mean, that's masterful. Definitely. Well, before we get into the interview, let's have a quick word from our sponsors. Massive reptilian monsters have begun to emerge from Mexico's volcanoes, wreaking havoc on city after city. Now the nation's only hope is for physicist Elena Bass and anthropologist Alfonso Becerra to overcome their long-standing feud and work together. For only a blend of science and myth can save Mexico from the ancient lords of the earth. Available in ebook and paperback from Severed Press, Lords of the Earth is a harrowing Mexican kaiju novel from award-winning writer David Bowles. Anarchists, assassins, and assholes make up the three types of people you'll find in Andrew Hilbert's new novel, Invasion of the Weirdos, out now from Perpetual Motion Machine Publishing. There's also a robot vending machine that hugs children. Yeah, things get a little weird in this psychedelic journey set in the heart of Austin, Texas. Obviously. Where else? Portland? Ha! Invasion of the Weirdos by Andrew Hilbert is available right freaking now. Okay, well, I believe, Bob, that you have John's bio. Yes, I do. John Padgett is a professional, though lapsed, ventriloquist who lives in New Orleans with his spouse, their daughter, and two cats. He is a senior editor of Vastarian, a source of critical study and creative response to the corpus of Thomas Ligotti. He has worked out or forthcoming in Pseudopod, Lovecraft Ezine, Noibis, Antenna Signals, and the Junk Merchants. A literary salute to the William to William S. Burroughs. And his book, The Secret of Ventriloquism, is available now and you need to get it. All right, and with that said, let's do it. Let's get John Padgett on the This Is Horror podcast. Let's do it. And now for a horror interview. John, welcome to the This Is Horror podcast. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. This is an honor. Ah, it's great to have you here. And I thought, to begin with, if we could talk a little bit about your first experiences with story. My first experience 
Yeah, so the first stories that you were reading or were uh, seeing in terms of movies or however you first experienced story? Yeah, well, um, I, I guess one of the one of the stories I always tell um, is probably even before that, though, um, I, I probably should should mention and give credit to um, my older brother, who uh, was the middle child of three. Um, I have an older sister. I have an older sister and a, uh, um, uh, an older brother, and I'm I'm the the youngest. And um, you probably uh, would recognize my my brother um, or a ver version of my brother from uh, the second piece in uh, the Secret of Ventriloquism. Mm -hmm. uh, the murmurs of a voice foreknown. Um, there, there's a good chunk of that, that story that is true. And um, my brother, just about every night, would tell me creepy stories that he would just make up. Um, and indeed, those stories did revolve uh, around various characters. Um, one was the hand, a disembodied hand that lived under my bed. Um, one was the doll. My, my brother was very good as, at exploiting my fears. And um, when I was about four years old, my parents uh, were watching the night gallery, which at the time I think was, was playing for the first time. And one of the episodes was called The Doll. It was based on the Algernon Blackwood story of the same name. And it concerned a living doll uh, that would, would come to life and had a poison on its teeth that was incurable. I had recurring nightmares about the doll for about five years uh, straight. Uh, and, and my brother certainly uh, fed that fear. I'm not sure exactly how he caught wind of it, but he definitely exploited it. So a lot of my early obsessions um, with story have to do with these improvised little ditties that he would tell me before I went to sleep every night. And, uh, um, and that does include, by the way, the, uh, the Sam character who uh, my brother claimed was uh, a brother who was born before I was and who died and who wanted to possess my, my soon to be dead body. Uh, and was trying to, uh, every day, was trying to convince my brother to kill me. Uh, so, yeah, I, I was, my, my uh, consciousness was, was pretty warped from an early age. And, uh, and I remember, uh, like a lot of people, my first encounter with literary horror or the macabre or the weird was uh, a book of stories um, by Edgar Allan Poe. Uh, I believe it was Tales of Mystery and the Imagination. Uh, and I, I remember particularly uh, the, the Black Cat and um, the Telltale Heart having a profound effect on me. Uh, there was also that weird uh, poem. I can't remember r r offhand who, uh, where it came from. It, uh, it may have been anonymous. Um, the Little Orphan Annie uh, poem. I don't know if if you guys are familiar with that one or not, but it's it, it's got some really uh, evocative and even I would say Lagardian lines 
about, you know, all concerning little kids who didn't behave properly uh, and met bad ends. Uh, and one of them was taken by goblins uh, and pulled up beyond uh, the attic of the house into another world. And, uh, and that really, really stuck with me. And, you know, er, er, ever since then, I, I, I became a voracious reader uh, early on and uh, certainly was not limited to the macabre. But I was always drawn to the macabre elements of whatever I read. I mean, I can remember even reading, you know, Tolkien's The Hobbit for the first time and really getting obsessed with um, the Gollum chapter, uh, Riddles in the Dark. And, uh, and then later in Lord of the Rings, I was, uh, you know, well before I read Lovecraft, I was, I was very, very obsessed with uh, Gandalf talking about uh, things far below the earth, you know, older than, than Sauron and, uh, uh, and the Watcher in the Water. Uh, so, you know, I, I, all of those elements really stuck with me in whatever I read. Uh, later on, I, um, I eventually got my, my graduate degree in English literature um, with, a, uh, with an emphasis on the uh, British Romantic poets. So, you know, I, I, I also kind of have always been attracted to the dramatic. And that's not surprising because since I was about six years old, I, I started uh, acting in plays in community theater. Uh, and that continued on into my 20s. I was always involved in some kind of play. I got my bachelor's degree in, in theater arts. Uh, and that kind of morphed into an interest in uh, voiceover work. Um, you know, I continued doing theater on and off, uh, uh, even in my 30s. But um, at early on, when I, I first discovered the works of Thomas Ligotti, I, I, started, uh, I started to read his work aloud and, um, and eventually started recording it. And later on, when I became friends with Tom, uh, I started sending him copies uh, which he would listen to on his way to, to work uh, in Detroit uh, to the Gale, when he was with the Gale Group. And, uh, and so that's kind of how I, I guess, sharpened my teeth on uh, narrative work, which is really, strangely, part and parcel of my collection. Um, it's really, it's really concerned with, with, uh, not only voice, you know, figuratively, uh, but also literally. Wow, man. Night Gallery, The Doll. I still can't watch it. <laughs> I never you finished know, watching that episode when I was a kid and I have Night Gallery on Hulu and every time I come and I see that and I'm like, whoa. I'm not watching it. And you know, one day I'm going to force myself saw, to do it. I only saw that one time when um, when I was a kid. And then in my 30s, uh, I, I got a copy of it and watched it for the first time. And I remembered everything about it, which is very odd. I, I by no means have an incredible memory for things that, that happened a long time ago. I'm, de I'm definitely, I, I'm, I'm definitely not good with those sort of things, but, but that particular short just was emblazoned on me. And, and I'm, 
completely uh, not exaggerating when I when I say that I had nightmares about that thing almost every night. And I mean, they were the kind of nightmares that you wake up from screaming. Uh, eventually, when I was about nine years old, I had my first lucid dream. It was right in the middle of a nightmare about her. She was chasing me as usual. Um, and I realized right in the middle of being chased that I was dreaming and was having another nightmare. I did not wake up. And um, if you've seen part of the doll, then you know that that the really hideous thing about this thing, this doll is is the grin. Uh, she had this huge, to be uh, insane grin, um, which uh, would appear on her on, on her face when she was about to kill. So, in the dream, I turned around on the doll, and the doll's grin faded from her face and I could feel my own face breaking into a rictus grin myself and I reached out my hands at her uh, and chased her, grabbed her and tore her to shreds and woke up laughing. <laughs> And that was literally the last time that I had a nightmare about her. Um, but then, just like clockwork, I saw the uh, the Twilight Zone episode, The Dummy, <laughs> with Cliff Robertson, which scared the hell out of me. And I was determined that I wasn't going to have recurring dummy dreams uh, after that. And that's why I asked my parents um, to get me a ventriloquist dummy. I wanted to know how it was done to demystify the practice of ventriloquism because I had no idea why or how um, one throws their voice or how these dummies could talk. And I took to it really, really well and easily. So well that in a couple of years I was performing around town at various events and uh, eventually doing kids' birthday parties. I graduated up to a more expensive dummy when I was 12 and then when I was 15 I got a loan from the bank and, um, and bought a professional ventriloquist dummy. Uh, which is the ventriloquist dummy I've had ever since, and who is uh, who makes at least a couple of appearances in my book, uh, mm. Reggie Pascal. Yeah, there's so many <laughs> directions we can take the conversation now. I mean, you <laughs> you've given us an awful lot to think about. So I wonder, you mentioned your relationship with Thomas Ligotti. So how did that friendship get started? What was your first correspondence with him? Yeah, that's that's a really good question. It was back in, I guess, I moved to New York City in 1997 um, to be with my then girlfriend, now spouse. Uh, and I got a job at a law library up there, um, Deckard, Price, and Rhodes, on the 22nd floor of the Rockefeller Center. This job didn't pay much. <laughs> it was a, uh, a law library job. Uh, I had a lot of experience um, throughout grad school. I, I worked at the university library, so that's what I did in New York. It did not pay much, but I had a lot of free time at work. <laughs> More free time at work than I've ever had before or since. And, uh, 
and at the time I, I, I was, I was very, uh, much obsessed with the work of, of Thomas Ligotti. And I was very frustrated by the fact that hardly anyone that I came in contact with knew who the hell he was. And, uh, and I wanted to tell people who he was, and uh, I, I gave out a lot of, of books to friends and you know, and acquaintances. Uh, but that job was the first time that I was really online a lot, and I discovered Usenet um, and Alt uh, Horror Cthulhu. Uh, that new, the, all those news groups. And uh, I started thinking it would be a good idea to create a, uh, a Thomas Ligotti news group. And, and, and I did. Um, it, it was a process, and there was a lot of discussion. And I was practically the only person who agreed that it was a good idea. Uh, the other person was Matt Carden who I mentioned earlier, mm. uh, the, the, the writer and wonderful writer and wonderful thinker, uh, Matt, uh, who I, who I became fast friends with. And for a while that in that news group, it was just Matt and I going back and forth, talking about Ligotti's work. Uh, it started growing from there and I decided to create a website, a fan website. And I didn't know how to create websites. So I started by, uh, you know, stealing code from another uh, website. I think it was a, a William Faulkner website that I used as kind of the template and started creating it from there uh, and teaching myself HTML in the process. Uh, so that was the first version of Thomas Ligotti online. Well, at the same time, I started figuring out more things about Ligotti. One of those things was that he worked at the Gale Group. So doing some research online, I started uh, coming into contact with uh, Gale Group employees um, and their email addresses. So I guessed it. Ligotti's email address, and I sent him a long email that I did not expect to be um, responded to. Um, but he immediately responded to me. Turns out that in his job, he had been watching my efforts in trying to, to get his, his work promoted, uh, including the website. Um, and uh, we started corresponding, uh, and I realized this guy's nothing like I thought he was. You know, I always thought that um, back then that Ligotti would be uh, a very quiet, dour, um, uh, misanthropic, unfriendly, um, uh, and 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 somewhat angry person. Uh, uh, Tom himself uh, certainly has wrestled with terrible uh, uh, issues, uh, particularly psychological in nature, um, and has struggled with, with severe anxiety and depression and agoraphobia. Um, but I, I realized very quickly that the the guy was incredibly funny, um, very engaging. Um, I, I knew that he would be incredibly intelligent, but I, I didn't realize that he would also be the best read person that I've ever known. I mean, the, the guy just absorbed uh, an, an incredible, uh, um, an incredible scope and range of, uh, of literature, um, not, not merely um, American, uh, but 
uh, worldwide. I mean, uh, and, and I also realized very quickly that he was uh, a kind and generous uh, person, uh, certainly incredibly generous with uh, his time. And, uh, and, and we became good friends. Uh, very, very naturally, you know, started talking on the phone every now and then. Um, at, even after all of these years, uh, I've never met him in, in person. Uh, you know, he, he definitely has a lot of social anxiety. Uh, and particularly after uh, the conspiracy against the human race, I think that there's been a lot of, uh, I think there's been a lot of, of misinformation about him um, and, and kind of some assumptions uh, of, about him personally uh, that um, are, are, are somewhat understandable, but, but um, also are, are rather frustrating, at, at least for me, if not for him. Um, and, and, and one of those is the you know, this idea that he um, hates people or, you know, is misanthropic. And uh, uh, actually, the guy, from everything that I've seen and experienced, is extremely good with people and, and feels deeply for, for other people, ironically. Um, he hates being alive. And he thinks that existence sucks, um, and and can't and uh, doesn't um, uh, believe that there's any kind of greater purpose. But he feels very deeply for people, both as individuals and as a whole. Um, and uh, that's something I've never really talked about publicly, but uh, it, it's something that I've, I've wanted to talk about for a long time. Uh, in, in essence, you know, my, and, and I was as guilty as, as anyone of, of having preconceived notions about him. You know, I, 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 really, I really had this idea in my 20s that, that he lived in a you know, stereotypical gothic mansion by himself and wore all black all the time and, you know, was very gaunt and tall. I had this mental picture of him. He was a know. vampire. <laughs> right. But basically, basically <laughs> like, you know, a, a dark god of literature, certainly somebody who, who didn't have a, a regular job and who just, you know, thought deeply and and wrote all day long i mean i had no idea back then um uh and uh all of those those notions were were blown away um when i became friends with tom and realized that he was one of the most humane uh person uh individuals i've i've ever known um, and has been through some really dreadful things in his life, um, and, uh, has struggled deeply and who, but also one of the most honest people that I've known, um, honest with others and with himself, uh, you know, and and the man uh, has been incredibly generous with me over the years. I mean, literally, he taught me how to write a, a story uh, that was worth anything. Um, and and I, I've said a num in a number of, of interviews, uh, but it bears repeating that um, the story 20 Simple Steps to Ventriloquism took almost 20 years uh, from beginning to, to end to get right. And, and the first version of it written in uh, the early to mid 90s was terrible. 
Um, I thought that it was brilliant, <laughs> of course, um, and slowly realized um, that it was awful and that I didn't know how to write my way out of a paper bag. Um, and, uh, and it took a long time to get a decent story out of that one. And it wasn't until I was able to write a decent story that I was confident enough to write more stories. In fact, I just wanted to write that one story uh, and write it well. I thought that was it. I'd be done. But I was wrong. The obsessions that drove me into writing that story drove me to write other stories. And there's no doubt that's probably why those stories ended up interrelating with each other. Uh, it's in retrospect, I almost think of the collection as a hybrid novel. Um, you know, and I have no idea whether I could write a proper novel or not, but that's, you know, and, and that goes back to the origins of uh, my personal macabre bent. bent. I, I've been asked before, you know, why horror? Why, why write horror? What um, are, are you interested in writing in other genres or, or writing just straight up literary work, et cetera? And, um, at least at this point, I, that's just the way my mind works. I, I'm, I never really set out to write a horror story. And that's one of the reasons why when I first read Songs of a Dead Dreamer by Thomas Ligotti, I knew that I'd found my writer, the writer who spoke to me more than any writer ever has that I understood um, that common twist of the, the brain and the imagination. Um, there, there's a, a certainly um, a macabre bent, but just a just a worldview that is a, a little off, um, uh, and uh, definitely obsessive, driven by um, panic and and suffering. Um, that. Uh, I knew once I read his work that if if I could write, that's the kind of material that I would like to write myself. Um, it, it's hard to it's hard to explain uh, verbally. Mm. You said that you learn a lot from Thomas Legatti. What was perhaps the most important writing lesson that Thomas Ligotti imparted to you? The most important lesson was that I couldn't write, <laughs> <laughs> which, which he certainly didn't, you know, he was very, very kind and generous. I sent him a copy of the original story. Uh, he was, he was nice about it. I could read between the lines that he, he you know, um, I think he, he said that, you know, he called it a, a Poe-esque Ligotian pastiche, which is what it was. Um, it, and it, it, but it wasn't a good pastiche. And at some point early on in our friendship, um, I, I told him that I really wanted to write a good story. Um, and I asked him to take off the kid gloves with me. Um, and he did, and it was brutal. You know, that's one of the reasons why it took so long for me to write it, because I would write a, 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 a you know, I, I, saying different drafts of the story really isn't accurate. I rewrote the thing probably a couple dozen times over the years, just rewrote it from scratch, tried different angles, Tried different, and and really, it became a completely different story. 
um, the only common element was a uh, ventriloquist dummy. Um, the most important of the lessons that he taught me as a writer was, um, and, and this really applies to somebody who has, who is trying to become a writer more than, than it, it, it has to do with this, an established writer. Um, he really wanted me to concentrate on the one element that I knew a lot about and that most readers would not know a lot about, um, and that was ventriloquism. Uh, you know, it was, it, it was his suggestion for me to really concentrate on that. And that is what led to uh, the story as it stands. And in many ways, the whole manuscript of the book. Uh, it, it, um, the, the, the story itself, you know, every iteration of it that I, that I showed to him, um, he had very detailed notes on, um, and, and, and would let me know, you know, you, you don't know how to do this yet. It, um, and this is, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. Um, very discouraging um, for, for a long time, but he always was encouraging me to keep trying uh, and, and, and keep searching. You know, I, I remember one conversation I had with him over the phone in the early 2000s. He was saying, you know, what... You know, I, I had I had flirted with the 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 title, the secret of ventriloquism. He said, "Well, what is the secret of ventriloquism? <clears throat> Do you know what that secret is? Do you know it?" And we started talking back and forth about you know the fear of dummies. What is that fear? Um, uh, we talked about um, well, you know, is the secret of ventriloquism hatred? So what kind of hatred? Um, and it was a very difficult question to pin down. And eventually, in about 2004, I was thinking about his story, um, 10 Steps to, to Thin Mountain. It's really just a vignette, probably a, a page and a half long. And, uh, and I started thinking about the little two-page pamphlet that I got with my first ventriloquist dummy when I was nine years old, Seven st Simple Steps to Ventriloquism. And, uh, and I was thinking about my story and wondering, well, what if, what if there are more steps? What, what if the writer of this uh, pamphlet uh, the freelance writer who was putting this together, a ventriloquist himself, what if he had a lot more steps uh, that, that the company didn't accept <laughs> uh, that got more and more bizarre um, and took up more and more time? Um, and so I sketched out an outline that ended with the the plane accident, um, which I remembered recently was uh, was in itself inspired by an old movie, an old uh, disaster horror movie uh, from the seventies with Richard Burton and Lee Remick in it uh, called uh, the Medusa Touch, um, in which. At one point, near the end of the movie, this man, I mean, with kind of chilling shades of 9-11, um, forces an airplane that he sees flying over the city um, into a building by using his mind, just by staring at it. Um, so when Ligotti got my my outline, 
you know, he'd pretty much been wholly <laughs> negative, except for a little passage here, a little passage there. Uh, but this was the first time that he said, you know, this outline could be a great story. Um, pursue this. And that's what I did. And then the real work began because I still didn't know how to write. I mean, I knew how to write essays. I knew how to write persuasive emails. Um, you know, like I said, I got a master's degree in English literature. I could write, but I couldn't write a story. I didn't know. I didn't know how. I'd read plenty, but that was the most intense period because that's the period after 2004, that's the period where I really started going back and forth with him every day and saying, okay, here's this part that I'm working on. What's wrong with this? Why doesn't this work? Um, and, uh, and it went on like that for a long time until um, the long version of the story, um, which he gave the thumbs up for. And, uh, and then uh, I'll, I'll only talk about this a little more. Um, you know, that version of the story was 14,000 words long or so. And I wanted to get it uh, published in Joe Pulver's anthology uh, the Grim Scribes Puppets. And uh, his word limit was 5,000 words. So that posed a big problem. For a while, Joe just sat on it and didn't give me a yay or nay. He said it's shortlisted, but you know, it's really long. So it was coming up to the final, final deadline. I knew it was going to make the cuts. And, uh, and I knew he liked it, but I also knew that it was very long and that I was literally a nobody on the scene. And, you know, the other authors in that book were not and are not. Um, so I decided to cut it down to get it below 5,000 words. I cut all of the characters. I cut the plot line entirely plots subplots i i boiled it down to um its essential elements um and i knew as i was doing it that i was making it a lot better than it was before um and, and by the time that i finished it was 4500 words and the Secret of Ventriloquism became 20 Simple Steps to Ventriloquism as a straight up guide. No characters other than, you know, the reader uh, and the kind of sinister force that was narrating. Um, and that's how that all came about. I still had that big story, though, about Joseph Snavely, his girlfriend, Margaret. Reggie, uh, and that's one of the reasons why the rest of the book happened, because I wanted to tell that story, and I wanted to tell a story of what came before it and what came after it. And how did it feel when, after working on it for so long, Ligotti gave it the thumbs up, and then again, when he managed to cut it, to 4,500 words for inclusion in Joe Pulver's anthology. I was astonished. I, I, I was astonished. I, I, had, I had reached a point somewhere in the mid to late 2000s um, where I just assumed that I was going to be fiddling with this thing for the rest of my life and never really, you know, nailing it. Um, and when, when I did, I mean, there were a number of breakthroughs. One of the breakthroughs was the most horrifying nightmare that I've had in my adult life, uh, which I had while I was writing it. And 
because I, I had I had reached an impasse at about um I guess step nine or so. Um I couldn't get beyond it. It was missing something. I mean I had all of the steps essentially, but it was missing something important. And uh and that turned out to be um, a, a turning point for the whole story. Um, but when it actually was finished and, and, and done, you know, Ligotti, Tom always told me that after he finished a story, he would take a walk of victory uh, around his neighborhood. Nobody else, you know, would know that uh, he was taking a walk of victory, uh, but himself. Uh, and I really liked that idea. So, you know, that's what Tom told me after it was done. He said, you know, you, you can take the walk of victory now. And I did. And uh, yeah, that, that felt really good. Because if there's if there's one thing that I know now, um, you know I've got I've got the same uh, I've got the same problems with with uh, ego that that most authors do. You know, um, I have fears that um, I'm a fraud, uh, that I don't really know how to write that. The people who don't like uh, my my writing, uh, who have reviewed me, um, are correct, and that everybody else is wrong, um, or um, is just deluded and somehow into thinking that that uh, my my work is worth anything. But that one story, that if I can. I can die being sure that that one story of mine is good and objectively good. It might not be to everybody's taste. Some people might even say, you know, I, I really didn't like that story. It was gross or, you know, off-putting or boring. But I know that it's good. And, uh, and, and that's something that I will always, always um uh feel deeply grateful to tom for because i i couldn't have i i mean he 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 was my mentor um and uh and, and even after that you know i was able to write more stories because i had the confidence and the skills to to do so um Again, <laughs> everything else I've written, I'm less certain about. But I didn't spend 18 years on everything else. Uh, so that's that's something as a writer. And, you know, I was talking to, to Bob about this, too. Um, uh, we, as writers, you know, you have to let go at some point of of how people are going to respond to your work especially i mean and and i say this as as a novice myself you know i, I just had my first collection out and for the longest time I've, I've been obsessed with you know what reviews am i getting not just formal reviews by any means but just people that are reading the thing you know goodreads reviews amazon reviews so that can be poison, um, especially if you're trying to create new work. Um, it could be poison on both sides, both the praise and the criticism. Um, and, and oftentimes the two of those online are, you know, can be fairly hyperbolic, at least to the author on both ends. You know, uh, um, there are way more reviews that that say, you know, this is fantastic, I love it. Um, and reviews that say, you know, this, what are people thinking? This is garbage. 
um, completely self-indulgent crap. Um, and, and and my tendency as an author, even though the latter uh, reviews have not been in abundance, my my uh, uh, personality type, what have you, um, always tends to to you know, obsess over the, the negative more than the positive. Um, and, and so, you know, it, the, it, in the last month, it's been, uh, it's been a, a struggle with my own ego to, to stop checking, stop looking or worrying about it. And I, I've had some success and some, <laughs> and some failure, you know, recently I, I, I looked on Amazon for the first time and it's like, oh my God, in the last week I suddenly got five or four uh, negative reviews back to back. What's going on? And, you know, it turned out to be that uh, um, there's a, uh, a Goodreads uh, audio group or no, well, they're not an audio group. They're, they're called horror aficionados and um, uh, they're, Within that, there is a uh, kind of an audiobook book club, mm. and and my book kind of won the monthly. This is what we're going to read, and there were you know there were a good number of that group that did not like my book, um, and that's a reality. Uh, that's and you know in some in some sense it feels like sometimes that the book has gotten more attention than it should have gotten <laughs> if that makes sense as if like you know it, it's it's broken through to you know out of the weird fiction readers and some some people who are more used to reading you know regular horror novels um, are, are reading it now and that's 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 reality and that and that's not to denigrate uh, uh, those readers at all. It's it, it's just a different audience, um, and, uh, and and you know I am no Legati, nor will I ever be a, a Legati, who I believe is one of our, our, our great living writers. I really really do uh, believe that, um, and you know was one of maybe ten living authors who have work published by Penguin Classics, um, and, and and justly so. But even, but even Tom, you know, he's got his audience um, of, of readers, and, uh, and certainly he's broken through that audience, and not all of them like his work. Uh, everybody's got limitations uh, at every author, um, and as I was saying to Bob earlier, you know, there are very few Stephen Kings uh, who can appeal to such a wide variety of readers. Um, and ultimately, I believe that as authors, no matter how good we are at marketing ourselves or getting our book out there to reviewers and readers, you know, at a certain point, after your book comes out, you've got to you've got to let go not o- not only of the negative reviews but the positive reviews as well. Um, that stuff can be poison creatively. And I like I've found that I like to write. I do, um, and uh, and I want to continue. I don't know how long, but I want to explore that that side of my life and you know i'm i'm 40 i'm almost 47 years old so this is all pretty late stuff uh for me um but i feel like i've got more to write but when you have those low moments and you fear that you're a fraud what is it that keeps you writing and how do you battle that that's a really good question. You know, the worst times by far were 
before I got published at all. Those years between, you know, 1993, 94 to, you know, 2010, when I was trying to write a decent story. And there would be, especially in the early years, yeah, Gotti would be, I mean, I told him to take the kid's gloves off. I brought it on myself. He's a very kind and generous man, but he is honest. Um, like uh, my spouse, <laughs> who is a, a, a poet and uh, an English professor, um, and actually was the first person to tell me that my story, the original version of my story, sucked. Um, and, you know, for a long time, there was a pattern of writing a new version of the story, showing Ligotti, and Ligotti, you know, tearing it up. Um, and, and very specifically telling me why, telling me, you know, what I needed to read, what I needed to do as, as a writer um, or an aspiring writer. And, and, and letting me know in un, no uncertain terms, you're not ready. Uh, this isn't, you're not ready. Um, you're not a writer yet. And, uh, and so my, my little budding ego just kept on getting destroyed and destroyed and destroyed. And uh, in those early years, I would think, you know, I, I, I'm not a writer. And I'm not going to be a writer. Why am I doing this to myself? Um, I need to concentrate on what I'm good at. Acting, you know, voiceover work, what have you. But this writing thing is just not me. I'm not good at it. I'm not going to be good at it. Fine. And then I would stop. I would stop for some months. And then the old impulse would come back up. I'd have an idea would strike me um, and I would find myself writing again. So really, it's the same, it's the same way now. At least now, you know, after, now that I've actually got a readership, um, not only through uh, the book, but also through uh, the, the places that I've been published in the past, Pseudopod, which I have four, I think, four pieces. One's about to come out. Um, uh, that, that's a very large audience in and of itself. A and uh, uh, got that original story a lot of attention. Um, you know, at least I know that some people are getting something out of this. You know, uh, I, I still have fraud fears but they're not like it was in the past. <laughs> mm. you know, I, I, at least I can, I can think, well, you know, I've, I've got quite a number of, of readers here that, you know, are under the delusion that I'm pretty good. Um, so, you know, I, I'll, 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 I'll let that build my confidence uh, and, and uh, make it easier for me to, to pick up a pen um at the very least and you know it comes and goes i mean you guys know how how the ego works um it's it's a bottomless pit you know and, and it doesn't get satisfied i'm sure that even uh the even cormac mccarthy probably feels feels sometimes <laughs> like he's not riding up to snuff um, or, or that he's lost it, you know, and will never be able to write anything decent again. Um, and, and the only way I can deal with that is by being aware of the ego voice in my head when, when it pops up. Absolutely. Thank you for listening to part one of our conversation with John Padgett. 
If you'd like early bird access to part two, then all you need to do is become a patron over on www.patreon.com forward slash this is horror. And if you become a patron this week at the three dollar level or above, then you'll be able to hear our second story unboxed episode where we're unboxing Rosemary's Baby. Story Unboxed is the horror podcast on the art of writing. In our debut edition, we unbox the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And next month, we're going to be unboxing the Yellow Wallpaper by Charlotte Perkins Gilman. So, a lot to look forward to. And don't forget that next month is the start of the This Is Horror Extreme Summer of Podcasting. What that means is we will be recording an extra regular episode in June, in July, in August. We'll also be recording a Patrons only question and answer session every single month of the summer. And there'll be a story unboxed episode every month. So that is nine extra episodes in addition to the regular content. And remember, for the Patreon Q&A and Story Unboxed, you can only get those episodes when you're our patron. So if we add value, if you like what we do, do consider supporting us. www.patreon.com forward slash this is horror. Okay, before I wrap up, quick word from our sponsors. Anarchists, assassins, and assholes make up the three types of people you'll find in Andrew Hilbert's new novel, Invasion of the Weirdos, out now from Perpetual Motion Machine Publishing. There's also a robot vending machine that hugs children. Yeah, things get a little weird in this psychedelic journey set in the heart of Austin, Texas. Obviously. Where else? Portland? Ha! Invasion of the Weirdos by Andrew Hilbert is available right freaking now. Massive reptilian monsters have begun to emerge from Mexico's volcanoes, wreaking havoc on city after city. Now the nation's only hope is for physicist Elena Bass and anthropologist Alfonso Becerra to overcome their long-standing feud and work together. For only a blend of science and myth can save Mexico from the ancient lords of the earth. Available in ebook and paperback from Severed Press, Lords of the Earth is a harrowing Mexican kaiju novel from award-winning writer David Bowles. Okay, remember to join us next week for part two of the conversation with John Padgett. We've got a lot of other interviews coming up. We're going to be chatting with Philip Fracassi later this week. So stay tuned for that conversation very soon. Before I go, I'd like to leave you with a quote from Ray Bradbury. You must stay drunk on writing so reality cannot destroy you. I'll see you in the next episode. Until then, take care of yourself, be good to one another, read horror and have a great, great day.